Um, I'm very happy indeed to be able to present Oronzo's book to you here and to recommend it to you all as the most useful recent addition to the whole field of Tolkien studies. We all got to have a copy. <laughs> now, um, as I say in my foreword to it, Tolkien is probably the best documented author in the history of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Christina Skull and Wayne Hammond have given us a chronology of his life which traces him often day by day. <laughs> you know more about Tolkien's week than I can remember about last week. <laughs> <laughs> but there are other circumstances which combine to preserve information about him. One, of course, is the very careful editorial work of Christopher Tolkien. Another is Tolkien's own habit of never throwing anything away. <laughs> uh, he also had a very well-documented life. For instance, I've seen his war office file, 70 pages long. It's very boring. <laughs> <laughs> and there's also his well-documented public life as a professor. And one other thing, the fact is that he became popular in the late years of his life, so that there was, and there still is, living memory of him. He was interviewed, people talked to him, people wrote down their recollections of it. Nevertheless, the best guide to an author's mind is through his books. And there again, a great deal of information has survived, not all of which was known. And since uh, uh, Barry Bond is here, Anders Jemstrom, perhaps I can mention that, when was it Anders? Many years ago? Yeah, I think <coughs> Yeah, uh, somewhere in the early 1980s, um, Anders came to stay with me in Leeds. Uh, he said, did I think that uh, Tolkien's poems had all been found? And I said, I don't know. Um, how about looking in the Leeds University magazine, the Griffin? So Anders went off to, uh, to the, the special collections at Leeds, and he came back and he said, do you think this poem is by Tolkien? And it was. Uh, it's the Clark's complaint. Uh, it had been printed in this magazine, and uh, we went through and we corrected the typos. <laughs> and, uh, Christopher, then, Christopher then found the manuscript, and we got it right. We got the typos right. <laughs> so, are there any more? I wouldn't like to say definitely not. Anyway, still, uh, uh, a great deal of information has survived. Uh, and, of course, uh, one reason is that Tolkien bequeathed many books to several libraries in Oxford and America. And uh, I remember this, actually, I, of course, I picked up Toronto's book and immediately started looking things up in it. And I remember in the Taylorian Museum, I was reading Hermann Schneider's three-volume Germanische Heldensaga for reasons of my own, and I just <laughs> signed by Tolkien. So I turned over the pages hoping to find really important uh, uh, notations, but there weren't any. <laughs> On the other hand, I didn't go far enough, did I? Because also, because also, uh, what has survived is um, Hermann Hirt's Indo-Germanische Grammatik, seven <coughs> volumes. I don't think anyone has ever read them. <laughs> <laughs> many, many years. But Tolkien read them. Uh, his, uh, his volumes are in the, the library of the Texas Agricultural and Military University. Tolkien not only signed them, he owned the books, he read them, he signed them, and he had strong feelings about them. And as Aronzo notes, he wrote, probably wrong. <laughs> Nonsense! <laughs> so much for Professor Hirsch. <laughs> well, as I say, uh, many of these books uh, survived. Uh, they went to libraries, mm. but others went on the market and were bought up. Uh, and actually, I'm very pleased to note, and it's Aronzo who points this out, that actually the guy who seems to have bought up more of them than anyone else was not a librarian. It wasn't an academic, it was an Oxford butcher <laughs> called Stanley Revel. And he bought up books signed by Tolkien when he found them in second-hand shops because he felt like it. <laughs> well, that was probably about the best investment of the history. <laughs> well, there is then a great deal of information which has survived. But the fact is that most of us don't know about it. Ah, but we do now.
Because Erasmo has carefully and scrupulously collected everything we know. Books which Tolkien owned or mentioned, they're classed as primary sources, and they're listed with notes on how we know about them. Books reckoned by scholars to be pretty certainly used by Tolkien are listed as secondary sources. Yes, but then there's a third group, inferred sources, which is actually in some ways the most interesting group because it's still open. We don't actually, not actually sure about them. This includes, for instance, works that seem to have been used by Tolkien in his work for the Oxford English Dictionary, which could be absolutely anything. Uh, but there's also works that you kind of might expect uh, Tolkien to have read for some reason or another. If you look up William Morris in here, you will see that Tolkien owned uh, a dozen books by Morris, some of them from a very early age. But one that he didn't own, as far as we know, do you know how many books you've owned in your life? <laughs> <laughs> well, the one that he, we don't know he owned was actually his most popular one. It was the romance of the well at the world's end, which was a big seller. Everybody liked it. C.S. Lewis certainly had a copy. It was, it's often mentioned. Well, um, did Tolkien read it? He may have borrowed. Perhaps he borrowed Lewis's copy. I don't know. It's quite likely. But anyway, we can't be sure. So that's really, uh, we could put that down as an inferred source. And actually, this is what I'm saying. Since this class is open, uh, this is one of the books which actually, where actually, you could break the rule. The rule is, don't write in books. <laughs> but this is one where I'm tempted to say, but you can write in the margin with a question mark, right? And see whether any information or any corroboration ever turns up. Well, uh, that's what I'm going to do anyway. Uh, I'm going to, I should, you can see I'm already turning over the pages to look things up. In fact, I can take my finger out that one now. Um, and uh, that's what I shall continue to do. But you could, I think, actually, open pages at random. And uh, that would be quite a good search procedure. If you go looking for something you know about, well, you might find it or you might not. But if you go looking for something you don't know about, then the, the random search is a good way of doing it. Well, anyway, so that's, that's, that's what I'm going to do. So let me say, this is a book we can continually refer to, and we can try to update where we can, and it's a book which will therefore remain in constant use. In constant use. And it represents, then, a great leap forward in Tolkien studies. And I think it will help very much in overcoming what is now a central problem in Tolkien studies. And that is the growing gap between our background cultural awareness and Tolkien's own background cultural awareness. Actually, I can feel this now. I mean, I, uh, I was born 50 years after Tolkien, and now I'm 75. So, you know, 25 years ago, I was much closer to Tolkien's background than I am now. And this uh, hit me when I got here, actually, uh, because I used to know this area like the back of my hand. Uh, in fact, I think we are standing pretty much where Mount Bosky's stamp shop used to be, which I used to go into when I was a stamp collector. But I'm not sure, because the whole place, I, I can't find my way around anymore. The whole of the center of Bowen has changed, and that's a kind of image of the way that your background knowledge disappears. Well, that's what's been happening. There's that gap between what we know now and what, what Tolkien knew, well, uh, 100 years ago. But this, this book then tells us a very great deal. There is a great deal of information in it. It is a data mine about what Tolkien knew. And actually, that's what we <laughs> need to know as well. And this, I think, is the best way get back to Tolkien's background knowledge. Thanks very much.